a Children of Dune, the third book in what's come to be called the Dune Chronicles, was originally published in 1976. It's a fuller and more complete novel than the previous installment, Dune Messiah, which was a little thin on story and felt at times like an extended epilogue to the original Dune. Author Frank Herbert ended the previous novel with the birth of Paul Atreides' children, Leto and Ganima. Now the twins are nine years old, and we follow them as they wrestle with the same dilemmas around prescience and power which consume their father. Familiar characters, like Aaliyah and Stilgar, attempt to guide them, while two characters who are noticeably absent from the previous book, Lady Jessica and Gurney Halak, return in this volume, as the Atreides family confronts the internal and external threats which mount against them. In addition to returning characters, there's an important return to the ecological focus of the narrative, with many scenes concerned with desert survival. The shifting nature of life on Arrakis doesn't just threaten the culture of its people, but could have devastating consequences for the entire universe. That tension between embracing change and preserving tradition is threaded throughout the novel, and it colors much of the palace intrigue along with the discussions of religion, genetics, and political morality. The novel does stall out a touch in its middle third, due in part to its structure. The short little stabs of chapter can be tedious to grind through, as the novel is early with its promise, but is late in actually getting there. We bounce between a half dozen groups and factions, each with their own distinct political and philosophical motivations. There are so many moving parts to this story, but they turn so slowly that it often feels like there's no forward movement. However, it can't be said that Children of Dune lacks focus. It's fully committed to its central thrust, and it certainly gets there in the end. It's weird at times, taking a full turn into the stranger side of science fiction, but it also delivers a satisfying conclusion to many of the character arcs, and sets up a bold new direction for the series as it moves forward beyond the original trilogy. The first time I read Children of Dune, it was from this Ace Trade paperback edition. It's designed in series with the other covers by artist Jim Turney, with two figures on orange and purple cliffs, separated by a gap. The moons are visible above a silhouette of a structure in yellow, and the vertical title is in green with black accents. The title page matches those from the other books, and this one begins immediately after a 2008 introduction from the author's son, Brian Herbert. He recalls the slow build of a fandom for the Dune series during his youth, which resulted in this book being a bestseller. At the back, there's a brief commentary from the author himself. Now, I've already upgraded to the Folio Society editions for the first two books, so when they announced that they would be releasing the third, I couldn't really resist. So let's do this. Here we have Children of Dune from the Folio Society. This version was released in 2024 and is presented in a black illustrated slipcase with shaped edges to accommodate the curve of the book's spine. It carries forward with the designs from the other Dune slipcases. The line work on the slipcase is in copper and is similar to the color in the second book, which might be gold. We have the sand dunes of Arrakis against the night sky, but these lines suggest rainfall, while these suggest emerging plant life. On the other side, these elements are even more pronounced and convey the changing ecology of the planet. The book itself is bound in a metallic gold-colored cloth that feels just like the others, with an amazing illustration on the front. The image is of Ganima and Leto Atreides, standing back to back in grey tones. The youthful look of the twins is perfect, and the details, like their hair and the gauntlets and straps of their still suits, is fantastic. The familiar speckled pattern, this time in a copper foil, seems to move up the cover and is also used for the curved horizon line and the two moons. On the spine, the author and publisher name are recessed in a blood red this time, while the title is flush and black with that same copper spice speckle from the cover image. The binding is appropriately finished with red head and tail bands. If we crack the book open, we see the same illustrated endpapers with a map of Arrakis by Martin Sanders that were used in the other books. 
The color is slightly different yet again, and trends closer to those found in Dune rather than those in Dune Messiah. The book is printed on Abbey Wove paper, folio's standard paper for the text block, which is smooth, acid-free, and comes in at a warm cream white. There's no table of contents, but the fonts and layouts are the same, including this design element which denotes the chapter epigraphs from the rest of the text. If we bring back the Ace Trade Edition for a brief side-by-side, -side, we can see that the Folio Society version is indeed bigger, with an extra 4 centimeters in the height and 2.5 centimeters in the width. The font size may be a touch smaller in the Folio version, with more lines per page and generous margins all the way around. Like Messiah, there is no biography for the contributors to this edition, nor is there an original introduction. The interior artwork, like the cover art, is by Hilary Clark. She's the artist who came on board for Folio's edition of Dune Messiah, and I'm thankful that she's back for the third book. Her work often features dynamic movement, which I prefer to static compositions, and it often includes elements of the surreal, which is necessary as this series gets weird. In Children of Dune, Miss Clark again provides color artwork and 10 black and white illustrations. Let's take a quick look at the black and white art first. These small drawings that appear above some of the chapters are done with ink and charcoal, like this one of a mala pistol wrapped in a priest's black cloth. They usually depict objects from the chapter they head, but they can also be symbolic, like this broken and frayed infinity rope that separates two silhouetted figures. It's always a fun treat to hit one of these pieces while reading. Hilary Clark also provides eight color illustrations done in oil paint on panel. They're presented on thicker textured paper and typically land within five pages from the text they correspond to. Let's take a detailed look at that artwork now. The first illustration is a scene that occurs on the planet Seleucia Secundus. A pair of Laza tigers are being trained to hunt children, and we see the beasts making their way towards two unsuspecting red-headed youth. The boy is focused on helping the girl, who's preoccupied with her footing. Their innocence and ignorance of the danger that threatens them serves as a great opening image for the novel. In this book, there are a few characters who wrestle with a well of genetic memory that they've inherited. These conscious personalities, echoes of past lives, dwell within the individual and may compete for control. In this second illustration, we get a depiction of the internal chaos as Aaliyah is overwhelmed by these other voices inside her. The flipped and twisted image, the creepy eyes and mouth, with a familiar silhouette emerging in the middle, all help convey the terror that Aaliyah feels at this moment. The third piece is of the not-so-mysterious preacher who emerges out of the desert to speak from the steps below the temple to the people in the square. In the background, we can see the lovely arches and the remains of the closing markets. The man rests one hand upon the shoulder of his young guide and raises his other arm in benediction. The placement of the hand cleverly obscures his face to maintain the uncertainty around his true identity, although this small desert creature serves as a clear hint. This illustration might be my favorite of the bunch. The fourth image is of Ganima Atreides, who approaches a siege at night. To avoid detection, she throws herself flat to the ground and peers out from around the giant alfalfa stalks with firm resolve on her face. She comes across as more mature in this image than she appears on the cover, but the gauntlet details remain consistent. I love how this illustration plays with depth of field, and the cool colors work well here too. The next illustration is of Farad N. Carino grandson of the emperor that Paul and the Fremen defeated. The academic historian is attempting to learn the Bene Gesserit ways. His first lesson is about patience and recognizing the instability of the universe and perception. He sits intently with his arms out in front of him and must stare at them until he can shift his perspective so that they appear very old, then very young, back and forth. This blurred echo effect is the dynamic element, but I really appreciate the design work on the tiled wall behind him, the flooring, and the details of his outfit. The sixth image is from a character named Sabina's perspective. Her uncle and Gurney Halak are frustrated with her failure. Namri has his hand on his knife, while Halak admonishes her, his chin line scar emphasized here. The background to this piece is strong, and Hilary Clark's choice to leave some of it raw and less rendered adds texture to the image. 
Note how the background comes to the foreground here, and the unblended brush strokes on Gurney's sleeve. Hyperrealism is great, but sometimes you've just gotta let a painting be a painting. The seventh image is a stunning double page spread. Leto is depicted here, taking steps towards what he calls the golden path. He feels a stretching of his vision, which is represented by these echoes of his face. These organisms are called sand trout, the larval form of sand worms. This moment is all about a blending, an adaptation, and the layering technique, along with the parallel shapes, helps the viewer understand. And that brings us to the eighth and the final illustration. Here, Stilgar and Duncan Idaho sit on cushions in Siege Tabor to share coffee after spending the entire night in discussion and debate. The serving tray and the copper pot are accurate to the textual description, but I especially like how this figure is completely recognizable to us despite having his back turned. We know this is the Gola hate, from his distinct hair and coloring, which we can recall from Hilary Clark's image from Messiah. The consistency of her artwork across both the Dune novels she's been a part of is one of the joys of collecting this series. This edition of Children of Dune is very solid. Yes, I would have loved an original introduction or some unique and exclusive back matter, but the attention to detail in keeping this novel in series with the others is appreciated. The build and the binding is excellent, as anyone who's handled the previous Folio Dune books knows. It has a great design, an illustrated slipcase, and wonderful artwork throughout. One possible area to watch out for in terms of quality control is on the printing of the spine. Perhaps it's just my copy, or maybe it's supposed to look like that, but the black text looks thin to me, and it came this way straight from the publisher. Beyond that minor issue, is it even an issue? And the potential for rubbing off this top foil while taking the book in and out of the slipcase, I'm pleased with this novel. It pairs up nicely with the other two Dune books, and right now, I am satisfied with the initial trilogy in the folio format. They all look great together. When it comes to my old trade paperback, I'm ready to move it to the Box of Doom, because that way I can make more room for more new books. As always, thanks for watching, and keep an eye out for future videos. When it comes to the stories you love, it's always worth upgrading your books.